passion fruit. Wow. I'll open it up when we, when we start talking fruit. Awesome. Oh, wow. Now I get to look at everybody's favorite fruits. My favorite <laughs> thing to do. Oh, look at that. Awesome. We got, uh, we got um, Macri you in know. New York. Favorite, favorite fruit is passion fruit. Amazing. Awesome. Yes, wow. there's mango for exotics. Horia, hey, Horia, nice to see your face. Awesome. So, look, uh, it's five minutes past, and I'm uh, I'm gonna try to be the timekeeper and you know really give the stage to um, to Stephen in a moment. But let me let me walk you through uh, the the introduction and how Stephen and I met, and then you know I'll give the mic uh, over to him. Uh, first, I'm Ciprian. My company is called Lateral, and we're a design and technology company. We have a bunch of studios. Alcyon Mobile is one of our mobile studios, and we do interesting work. For example, we're building the uh, equivalent of Uber for trash, and it's a, it's already uh, um, you know running over over a billion dollars in sales in terms of you know doing waste management so a company called rubicon global and we're building all the technology for them but today it's not really about me it's about this wonderful man and uh, the movement that he's built and i'm going to take you all the way to costa rica more precisely to a place called punta mona and as you can see from this map there's no roads that can take you there in fact uh you know I'm kind of spoiling a bit of a secret here because you're supposed to leave there and what I saw and what I heard and you know uh, the, the, the wonderful findings. And to get there, uh, after a plane ride, you had to go through this crazy jungle of beautiful plants and insects and everything. It got pretty muddy as well. So there's only two ways to get there. Either you hike through the jungle or uh, you can take a boat. But after that wonderful journey, this is the scene uh, that uh, that we saw. And, you know, Punta Mona, it's this community behind the behind these beautiful palm trees. And the welcome was this. This is what we had on the on the, on the table. And I got to meet Stephen and I was so impressed and I thought maybe I can do uh, a small favor for everybody else that I know and bring his knowledge to you guys and so uh, that's what we're doing today but first why don't we do a little quiz and uh, steve has, has got this thing on his instagram know thy fruits and we're going to do a, a a short poll and we're going to start <laughs> with something fairly easy and i'm going to let people type in the chat and see if uh, if you know what what we've got going here do you know what this uh yeah, yes definitely <laughs> We got it easy. This is a pineapple bonsai. So we're starting easy. Awesome. What about this one? Does anybody know what this fruit is? Mm. Dragon fruit. Yeah. Very good. Amazing. Nice one. Very nice. Okay, let's just dry, take it up a notch. What about this one? Coco. Very good. Very good. Impressive. Impressive. Okay, next one. What about this one? You've got Steven holding it. A massive fruit about about his head. Jack. Jack. Yeah, nice one. Excellent. What about this one? Got Stephen here again. Durian, durian. Yeah, some people have traveled a lot. It's one of the most the stinkiest fruits. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a quiet. Hey, taste. hey, hey, easy. I'm if something's stinky, does it just smell strong or is that a negative connotation? It's actually an amazing fruit. I think there's okay, there's, okay, okay. <laughs> there, there's uh, um, I think I think there's probably people who love it and people who you know uh, who, who, who who like it less. Let's put it that way because of the of the of the scent that it that it gives. As a, as a fun I usually I usually trust. I usually trust those people a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> As a fun fact, in Indonesia is known as the king fruit, so they love yeah. it there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Nice one. What about this one? Does anybody Ooh, know what one. this one is? And bonus points if you can if you can call it into the you know into into what they call it in Costa Rica because they've got another 
Uh-huh. I'm looking, I'm looking at a tree right now, right there. Boom. So this one is soursop, or what do you call it in Costa Rica, Steven? Guanabana. Guanabana. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> And you know what? In in Indonesia, they call it durian blanda. Because it kind of looks like durian. They call it durian blanda. Or Malaysia. In Malaysia, they do. Beautiful, beautiful food. Okay. Next one. Let's make it. This one is an easy one. Mm. Mango steam. Yeah. Very good. Very good. What about this one? Ooh, good. That's a tough one. I'm looking at one of those two right now. Anybody know? Cherry something. Ah, Luisa. You is, Luisa, you've been to that part of the world. <laughs> Don't count. <laughs> but yes. Yes. Uh, is it pitanga? Am I pronouncing it correctly, Stephen? Uh, in Spanish. In, in English, it's actually called Suriname cherry. Suriname cherry. Awesome. Awesome. What about this one? This was the most surprising one of them all that I actually mm-hmm. covered when I was in Costa Rica. Does anybody know this guy? It's it's got well it's it's kind of common name is miracle berry. And what it is it's a berry that makes everything sour taste sweet. I remember yep. that correctly, right, Steven? Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. And it's got another name called Coco cocobolo or something like that cocobolo no yeah. no miracle no? just, put just them miracle in cocobolo is a wood that yeah cocobolo is a native tree and then how about this guy oh so good so mm. good. this was just ah oh, amazing so mm-hmm. this one is called the biriba right mm-hmm Am I, am I correct? That's a, it's a relative. It's a relative of the soursop. It's from the and Amazon. It, and you'll, you'll never Amazon. see it in a market. You'll, you'll never see it in the market because the shelf life is very short. There's many fruits out there that are incredible that you'll never taste unless you go somewhere that is like a collector um, because they're, they're, they don't have long shelf life. Yeah, 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 yeah. So an amazing fruit. And now the last fruit here. The bananas, the famous banana. And mm-hmm. how many of the, how many species of bananas do you have there or varieties, sorry? Of varieties, I think we have like 30 something. And that the one in the center is called the Cuban red. It's so good. The one on the left that Spencer's holding is called the rhino horn. It's the largest of them all. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. So. The real story of what connected me to Stephen was his story about how he arrived in, in Costa Rica. And you tell this story best, and, and Stephen, you, you've done so much. I mean, I can just think of so many things that you have done and the plans that you've got lined up. I'd love for you to share with the group the story of how you got to Costa Rica and to Punta Mona, and what, what's the relationship between that and the bananas that we see here. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I grew up in North Miami, Florida, um, in the suburbs, very normal childhood in Miami. And, uh, I came to Costa Rica. I mean, I will say that I always really liked, um, oh, come on, everybody turn on your videos. (laughs) I want to see. Um, yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Christina, awesome, Lorena, uh-huh, there we go, Vardis, Kaylin, Christian, Misi, uh, oh, wow, where are you, Mikri uh, Dragoy? You're somewhere pretty. Uh, awesome, <laughs> thank you. That's my greenhouse, that's my greenhouse. Oh, wow, where are you? I'm in the house, that's uh, only a, a, a wallpaper, but that's uh, the actual greenhouse. I have a green tropical plant greenhouse here in Transylvania. Oh, it's a wallpaper, <laughs> okay, okay. Cool, but that's awesome. that's his house. That's his house in in Romania. He's built this crazy thing from with his bare hands. A cool, uh, amazing, <laughs> awesome, awesome. All right. Well, it's so thank you so much. It's so great to see you all. I appreciate you taking the time. So many things to do in this life, and here you are, chosen to spend the next hour with us here. 
on our screens looking at a bunch of squares. So I, uh, I first came to Costa Rica on vacation and I fell in love with the country, how beautiful the, the forests and the people and the rivers and the beaches. And then one day I, um, I read in my little tour book, my dad was such a great traveler. So we would go places and my dad would just like read everything about the place. And I remember in those days we didn't have phones and we didn't have internet. We just had like lonely planet travel book. And I remember reading about this town called Bribri, which was the administrative center of the indigenous Bribri people. So I went, I decided out, well, that sounds really interesting. So I, I decided to go there. And meanwhile, I'm like cruising through the, the forest and there's these little like thatch indigenous huts and beautiful indigenous children selling fruit on the side of the road. And it all just felt so beautiful. And then as I'm meandering through the forest, all of a sudden I come around this corner and as far as my eye could see were banana plantations. And I remember just being like, <gasps> like, what's happened? What is this? And, uh, and I don't know what inspired me, but something I decided there was like a little dirt road that went right through the plantation. And I decided to drive in and I'm driving through the plantation. And meanwhile, I don't know if you've ever seen them. They put these big blue plastic bags laden with chemical over the bananas. And here I am driving and it's just like endless bananas, just endless, everything. It looked, you know, it was, it was almost like being in a factory, but a agricultural factory, it felt so sick. And then all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, this plane comes with a big stream of smoke behind it. I literally thought the plane was gonna crash because it was flying so low. And then it flew right over my, my rent. I'm in my little rental car. It flies right over me and my face and my eyes start burning. And then I watch it fly right over a playground full of indigenous children playing soccer, playing football. And it was kind of like pulling the emergency break on my life. How could this be happening? These beautiful indigenous people, indigenous people that have literally treated the earth like it's an extension of their bodies for centuries. Like, how can this be happening? And who's responsible? You know, when like, when you don't like something, often we don't really look at ourselves. We just want to point. Is it, is it Monsanto? Is it Costa Rican government? Is it Chiquita Brands? Is it Dole? Is it Del Monte? Who is it? Who can I point at? When really what I realized, it, it, it was me, you know, I was slicing those bananas into my cereal my whole childhood. And, uh, and basically I was, I was voting for that kind of thing to happen. And so I kept driving and then all of a sudden this like metal, like cable thing came down in front of my car. So I'm just sitting in my little air conditioned rent a car with my, my pretty girlfriend and I'm sitting there in the car and then all of a sudden big bunches of bananas start going along the cable in front of me. So I'm just kind of like zoop, 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 watching them go by and they're big and giant and perfect looking. I mean, giant bunches. And then after like 20 or 30 bunches went by, there was a guy hanging like from his backpack from the same cable and he was moving the bananas along. And he stopped right in front of my car. And he literally looked at me right in my soul. And it might've been 15 or 20 seconds, but it felt like 15 or 20 million years. And I literally, I almost felt like somebody took me like in a slingshot, my little body and doop, shot me up into the space. And, I, and from far away, I could just see this planet, this big blue and green planet spinning. And, and it all just seemed so perfect and so beautiful. And, and from far, it, it seems that way. And then, you know, looking a little closer, what the hell was going on there and who was responsible? So, I mean, it was just kind of like, I, I felt like I got woken from deep slumber where like, I never even knew things like this were happening. I never even knew that it was possible that we could be so terrible to the to nature and to the to the ecosystem to the rainforest but also how can we be treating these people this way these beautiful indigenous people spraying them with neurotoxic chemicals so we can have cheap flawless looking bananas most of the chemicals that get sprayed 
or is a fungicide just so the banana doesn't get these little brown marks on it. It's not even for the taste or the or the for the fruit. It's just kind of a full aesthetic reality. And so I I felt so sad and, and sick and I just felt, well, what can I possibly do about this? What can I possibly do about it? So I started thinking, I, I felt like the first thing that needs to happen is people need to know about this. Everyone in the whole world needs to know about this. So I started thinking in my in my head, you know, in the US, like they have these like news shows. One is called 2020, another one's called 60 Minutes. And I thought, wait a minute, maybe what I need to do is everybody needs to know this. We need to get this on the news. This is tragic. And then as I started investigating a little bit, I started finding that most industries are this way. You know, most food is produced this way. Most of our things are produced this way, where we buy things and just so we can have them, we're destroying whole realities. We're destroying ecosystems and we're destroying people's lives. You know, it's like just so we can have things. And all of a sudden I felt my connection to the bigger picture, my connection to all things like it was the first time in my life, like I felt like I was part of everything. And that was so, that was so big. It was like such a transformation to feel that. And so I decided, I don't know if I should go on the news shows, maybe like they'll come send a hitman or something after me, but I want to start grassroots. I want to start educating. So I started an educational uh, tour company, bringing high school and college students from the U S and Canada and Europe down to Costa Rica and I, I created a program. I created an experience where people would taste how incredible Costa Rica is, how beautiful the, the people and the forest. But at the same time, they have the opportunity to experience um, the reality. You know, I don't wanna be like this cover up. I wanna show the real Costa Rica. I wanna show the reality of the rainforest destruction. I wanna show the reality of the indigenous cultural decimation. I wanna show the reality of the agricultural industry. There's agricultural factories that are just destroying all things. And and so, yeah, there you go. That's so yeah, that, so, yeah, so this, yeah, I mean, you could see that on the bottom right, how it's just like a factory. I mean, it's just like, wow, how could this be that we can turn like this earth that used to be primary rainforest teeming with with wildlife all of a sudden into this industrial factory that that is just so sick so um and then i wanted to show solutions and you know i was 21 years old just like i didn't know the solutions i didn't know what that even meant but i knew that i wanted to try to show a different way to design things you know you guys are designers right Cyprian, you guys are a lot, a lot. A lot of us are designers and yeah. engineers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what is this? Like, we can design technology to to create garbage Uber pro projects, or we can design, you know, T-shirts, or we can design like little things that go inside these little boxes that make our phones work. But who's designing our reality? Who's designing our cities? Who's designing our towns? And, and what I started to realize that there's so much into this design, there's the physical design, like, you know, how are we gonna set up the roads and how are we gonna move around the water and how are we gonna deal with wastewater and where is the electricity gonna get made and how is it gonna get distributed? You know, so there's the whole, and then food, where's our food gonna come from? And, and so there's the physical design, but then there's a whole other split to the design. There's the socioeconomic design. And, that, and that's where Punta Mona came about as a kind of like as an experiment of design, you know, it's like, and, and can we actually live where our food is coming from? Like, why is it that we live over here and our food comes from all the way over here? And it's just like, who is the mastermind behind all this? And, and how can we start getting involved in that design? And so Punta Mona, is uh it started as 30 acres and you can see it there it's kind of at that point beyond right. those waves right there um a little bit to the left yeah. like see where it like juts out that point that's where it starts a little bit more right there yeah. yeah that's where it starts and uh and so 
we started we started to design and we started to build our buildings from fallen trees trees that were already on the ground like we milled them right there in the forest in fact i i can show some pictures uh of the buildings so maybe how about this yeah so we started building all the wood came from fallen trees and uh we started um farming and and growing things and we started you know we had we were off the grid there's no road to get there so we had to we had to figure out um you know we had no groceries we had no electricity we had no grocery store or pharmacy or hardware store where were we going to get the things that we needed to to start living and so so it was a very interesting process of you know i came from the suburbs you know it's like I, i turned on the water and it came on every time and honestly to this day, I have no idea where everything comes from. And I flush the toilet or it goes down the drain and I have no idea where it goes. So all of a sudden I was like thrown into a reality where all of these things were now present and I needed to start you know, learning about where these things came from and where they, they go. And, and, and I got into agriculture and plants, into botany and uh, I love the idea of ethnobotany. You know, I became, I consider myself an ethnobotanist. Ethnobotany is the study of the relationship between humans and plants, you know? And it's like, that seems like really foreign. Like what's our relationship? You know, like Michal has that beautiful palm there behind him. You know, it's like, what's your relationship between the plants? Like the plants that we, that we eat or the, plants that we wear or the plants that we build with or the plants that we make perfumes out of or the plants that we dye things with or the plants that that we get drunk off of or the plants that are so magical and have all these kind of just this deep magic and the relationship between where they came from to where they are now you know and I love the word diaspora I don't know if you know that word diaspora it's such a maybe I don't know if it's the same in Romanian but the diaspora is the journey from the homeland. Like where did the plants come from and where are they now and how did they get there? To me, that whole reality is fascinating. So- You've collected crazy amounts of plants even, right? I guess. Yeah, yeah, so I've been, I've been collecting plants like crazy and, uh, and I've gone all over the world finding interesting plants and then bringing them back to our farm and then spreading them. like. Because when I first moved to Punta Mona, we ate fish, yucca, and plantains, because that's what my neighbor Patty ate. And all of a sudden, one day, my friend gave me a small cutting, a small stick of a plant called chaya. And I stu- and he's like, oh yeah, stick it in the ground. And it, it'll, because in, in, when in the tropics, you could just take sticks off it and stick them in the ground and they start growing again, because it's so humid. And, uh, and so I did that and all of a sudden I had unlimited steamed greens. So I was eating fish, I was eating yucca, I was eating plantains. And all of a sudden I had unlimited steamed greens, which was a miracle just from a stick. So I started figuring, I started thinking, wow, there must be so many sticks out there that could radically improve people's lives. And I want to find them and I want to spread them and I want to radically improve people's lives. And so so yeah, basically that's uh, that was kind of the beginning of my journey into into plants and into oh look at Frankie, um, and and into into this relationship with our food. You see there every day at Punta Mona before lunch and dinner we make a circle around our food and we hold hands and it's like this celebration of our meal. And you know I I think back of like and it's not just our meal, you know. Um, it was just such a celebration. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a couple stories. Let me see how much time we have. We're good. So, so I lived in Spain. I lived in Spain. On, I did a semester in college in Spain. And I lived with this elderly woman um, that I called Abuela. And, uh, and I remember I used to go shopping sometimes with Abuela. And we would walk through the... And, and let me just give... Talking about design. We lived in Sevilla in this like apartment complex. There was like 10 buildings in a row. And on either side of those buildings, there was like four lane, busy, busy streets. And, uh, and in between all the 10, but you never had to go. Yeah. So in between the buildings, there was like trees and park benches and it was really beautiful. And, but you never, ever, ever needed to go to those busy streets because all 10 buildings 
had commercial things downstairs. It had restaurants and bars where the men would scream for their soccer team. And they had cheese shops and meat shops and vegetable shops and um, nail places and hair places and the places where the uh, kids would play video games. And, and, uh, and it was so interesting because we, I used to walk with my abuela to go to the store and it was interesting about my abuela is she didn't have like regular clothes. She only wore nightgowns. She always wore a nightgown with no bra or anything. And she just wore her nightgown and we would walk through the street to, uh, to the store and, and we would walk and she'd be like, hola abuela, hola Mario. We'd walk a little more, hola abuela, hola Maria. I just wanted her to be like, hola big bird, hola snuffleupagus. What is this freaking Sesame Street? Why is everybody so nice to each other? It was just like, wow. Um, everybody's just so nice and kind and sweet to each other. It was so beautiful. And then we would walk into, uh, we would walk into the store and uh, before she even asked for anything, the, the shop guy's already getting her stuff ready because she's been buying the same things probably forever, probably from his father who used to work there. And, and the exchange between her and the person we were buying the stuff from and, and, uh, and he just wrote down what she got. I don't even think she signed anything. And she, I, who knows, like maybe later they sent a bill or someone, her nephew, I don't know how it all worked. But everywhere where we bought things was almost like we were buying from our friends or our family or our cousins. And so to fast forward a little bit, after I had already moved to Costa Rica, I have this friend named Rolf Ruge. Rolf Ruge was this incredible man. May he rest in peace. He was the founder of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the Feria Verde, which was, it's like the best organic market in, um, in, in Central and South America. It's this epic, epic market. And he, he, his house was kind of like the epicenter of the ecological movement. So anyone that was doing anything cool in Costa Rica, um, was, was always having lunch at his house. And I remember he would start every lunch and he would say, no hay ningún ingrediente en mi mesa que no conozco el nombre y el apellido del productor. He would always say, there is not one ingredient on my table that I don't know the first and last name of the producer. And then he would start to like introduce all the different ingredients on his table. He would, ah, the, the tortillas were grown by, uh, um, Lainer Gomez and uh, the, the corn was grown by him and his wife Esmeralda would make the tortillas. And then, ah, and that salad, the cucumbers and the tomatoes, they came from Julio Dominguez and uh, from Finca Sueños. And, and he would just go around the table introducing us to the food as if it were, were like all a bunch of friends and just this relationship and this frequency because food carries so much more than the nutritional facts say. There's so much more to our food than what the scientists could label. Like, oh, there's carbohydrates and there's protein, but there's magic. And the scientists haven't even been able to measure that magic. And, and, and so that was such a profound, and I know, and I'm sure all of us, we wanna live in a world where we support ecosystems. We wanna live in a world where we support people and make people's lives better. Like, how can I move through the world so that all that I buy and all that I do and all that I touch makes the world better and improves people's lives? Because, you know, it's like, no matter what we do in our lives, like, what do we leave behind? It doesn't matter how much money you made or how much property you own or how much, you know, it's like, what do you leave behind? And, uh, and how many people's lives can, and can we make better? So, after many years at Punta Mona, we, um, we were really, it was kind of like a training ground and practice into permaculture. And so permaculture is a, uh, is a ecological design philosophy. And Robert, I see your question, I will get to it. Um, permaculture is a ecological design philosophy. And you know, it's, it's, it's not a farming technique. A lot of people think, oh, a permaculture farming. No, permaculture is not a farming technique. It is really just, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's more than anything, it's a philosophy. And it's the philosophy that, that, that measures um, energy. And, uh, and there's a word, a permaculture term that I love, it's called eroi. I'll put it in here. Energy return on energy invested. Yeah, yeah, energy, yeah good job, Zifran. 
it's ah. energy returned on energy invested. And it's like, we're constantly doing that, you know, as like the CEO of a company, you're pra- you're seeing like, okay, I'm paying this department is spending this much money. What are they producing? You know? And it's not like in a selfish way, but in, even in every relationship, like every relationship you have, I'm sure all of you raise your hand. I want to see you raise your hand. If you're in sometimes in relationships that feel like they're a negative eroy that like you give and give and give, but you don't really feel like you're receiving. And it's not like a selfish thing to, to feel that way. Like you need to feel reciprocal, you know, cause over time you can do it for a while, but over time it's going to collapse. So, um, so I got into permaculture and I, I started thinking, you know, Punta Mon is an amazing place to, uh, to teach people and it's a great school and, uh, and, and, but I want to do more. I want, you know, my parents are getting older. I want to have children. Like how can we design the way things are? How can we design our villages and design our towns and design our cities, you know? And, you know, it's a lot harder to fix up a house, uh, an already built old house. It's a lot harder than building new. So it's like, and, 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 and I know that with the bureaucracy and the red tape to deal with like city laws and city commissions, you're going to spend all of your energy, remember Eroy, dealing with coding and permitting and, you know, but maybe we could just start fresh. Maybe we could start taking raw land and, and redesigning. So in 2005, my dad had just retired from 35 years of a de- as being a dentist. And we decided we were going to start developments. And we basically made a criteria and our criteria included, um, like, first of all, you know, anytime you want to do something, it's really important to create a criteria so that you can get there direct, you know? So the criteria for what we, for the land that we wanted to start this communities on was basically, I knew I wanted to be in Costa Rica because I love it here. I mean, it's just incredible. Costa Rica has no army. They don't spend money on an army, which to me is such a beautiful thing. So all that money can go to education and can go to more important things. So, you know, really supporting, you know, your people. Costa Rica also has the largest middle class in Central America, which I think that's one of our goals is we want to, we want to bridge the gap between the have and the have nots. How can we create it? So everybody has, you know, what does that look like on a macro scale? Um, And then I knew I wanted to be, closer to San Jose, you know, because like the journey to Punta Mona, Cyprian said, it's a journey. And I, so I started thinking, okay, I want to be within one hour of the airport in San Jose. Okay. Then I want to be between 400 and 700 meters above sea level. I like that range because I like, it's kind of on an edge in permaculture. We talk about edge. So it's, it's low enough where we could still grow a lot of the tropical fruits, but it's high enough. So it's a little cooler so we can grow a lot of the vegetables and it's a beautiful climate to live. Like, I wish you guys, I wish you could feel the climate right now here. I mean, it is delicious, like just incredible. And, uh, and so the next thing I knew, I wanted to be able to lie on a big hot boulder and take in the sun until I'm so hot that then I can roll into the crystal clear river and drink the water. Awesome. I mean, come on, this is our dream. Like we could, we can make the criteria, whatever we want. When you're dreaming, like even if you're looking for a husband or you're looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend, like what's your criteria? The clearer you get on your criteria, the easier it is to find whatever it is you seek. So just remember that when thinking about criteria. And then the last thing about the criteria is you wanted to find land that was already destroyed. Um, I don't know if you could go to Google. If you want to go to Google Earth, it's always an interesting thing. And put La Ecovia in Google Earth. That's always a really fun. Um, oh, look where you are. Hey, Port Lauderdale. Um, it's always a really interesting. And then hit the hit the satellite. Mm-hmm. And move a little bit to the left because you moved. Uh, do it again because I think you moved away from it. Yeah. So, um, so basically, we found that we raised some money. We raised a couple million dollars, and we bought this property that's 17 hectares. And if you put your cursor right 
to the left side, the house that's the farthest to the left with the green roof. See right now, a little lower, 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 right there. That's where I'm sitting right now. And uh, and so we bought the land and that's my that's where I'm sitting right now. Like, can you see me? Wait, can, I'm waving, can you see me? Um, and, um, and so this property is 17 hectares and there's 45 families from 22 countries living here. Uh, and we started a school with, that has um, over, over 40 children from all these different countries. And if you look uh, right, right in the center, on the bottom center above that blue roof, you see a little circle, a little lower, a little lower, no, a little lower, a yep. little lower, right there, yeah. That's our communal garden. So instead of having a golf course and tennis courts, we have a giant communal garden. So every Saturday we get big baskets of food. And especially now during COVID, like be, being in this space with 45 families, because like, if you want to do a different kind of education for your children, it's so hard on your own. So what do you do? You just send them to the school nearby, you know, or if you want to take care of your 80 year old parents, it's so hard by yourself. So what do you do? You just send them to the old age center, you know, but all of a sudden we're 45 families, you know, the power that we have is so collective. You know, it's like if, all, if we want organic vegetables, we're 45 families, they come straight to our door and deliver it. We want fish right from the fisherman. He's going to come right to our door. We want um, anything. It gets delivered to our door. You want a massage? No problem. We have massage therapists coming in. It's all on WhatsApp. Like we're, I'm in 40 different WhatsApp groups, whether I want organic cashews or I want coconut milk or, you know, everything gets delivered to the door because we're so many people. And, and so one thing we realize as, as great, oh, and, and I guess the last thing I want to say is like about that is like being a developer. Now let's zoom out a little bit, Cyprian. This is going to be very interesting. Zoom out a little bit. Look, first of all, look at the green in Ecovia, like this look like the land around it. Look at all the clearings and the pasture. It's all cattle. This was a cattle pasture. Look at it now. And, and being developers, does being a developer in its essence mean we have to come in and destroy the land? What if, because we're developing, just because we're developing it, we're radically improving it? Imagine that. Imagine that. Right now, developers destroy land. Imagine if by developing it, by coming in and developing it, we make the land better. So... Super on zo zoom out a little bit more. Now, right next to my house, you see, no, go a little closer. Alegria is this whole big land. So three years ago, we bought the property next door, which is 70 hectares, right when Super came here. Um, a little bit higher. If you zoom in, you can even see the cool garden there. Um, a little higher. Go up a little bit. Up. No, not in. Up like, like move the whole, yeah, that down. See, you can see the garden there and the little dome there a little higher uh, up off of Ecovia. You can see right, yeah, right there. You can kind of see the garden. Um, and yeah, that right there, exactly. And we, cool. we bought the property. And the first thing we did is we started planting hundreds of fruit trees and native trees. And we started this epic garden. And we said, you know, it's like, we're only limited. Our dreams are only limited by how big we dream. And we said, yeah, let's make a big, big mandala. And let's make a Fibonacci spiral garden coming off of it. And so we created this epic garden. I was like, yeah, and then let's throw a 20 meter dome right in there, right in the center. Cool. And so now, boom, you know, from, from, from idea to dream unfolded. And so now these gardens are pumping food. And it's the first thing we did. And they're like, oh yeah, well, let's build a yoga deck right there above above the garden, looking down on the garden. So you could do yoga and you could like look over the most incredible cool. garden. And uh, so that's basically what's happened. Now you can see the dome on that picture on the right from the yoga deck, it's overlooking the garden. And uh, and we always knew at Ecovia, there wasn't enough people living there. You know, we had, you know, 45 families, but what happens in the end with 45 families is you don't have enough, you don't have enough 12 year olds, or you don't have enough people that are into kickboxing or, you know, it's like we needed more critical mass. We didn't have enough people to open a store, a health food store or a, uh, or a restaurant. So with Alegria, now it's 140 more lots. And, uh, um, about on July 10th, 2000, wow, it's windy on July 10th, 2000 and, um, 
nine, uh, 2020, um, a fine gentleman by the name of Zach Efron came here to visit us and we filmed a TV show together and it's called Down to Earth. And it was the number one show on Netflix for 10 days internationally, like globally. It was the number one show. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I'll throw it in, in the uh, Down to Earth episode three. He went to seven countries and he came to Costa Rica and he chose me to be his guide here. And it's unbelievable what happened. Like in the last six months, nearly 6,000 people have reached out to us wanting to be a part of what we're doing. So this is happening. Uh, so exciting. Like just absolutely like I just right before this, this call that we're doing now, I was on a zoom call with the Alegria team and the roads are going in and the fiber optic internet is going in and the, every it's just happening like right now like i actually as i'm here i hear the machines up the road just making it happen and it's it's a pretty aggressive time like making roads and stuff and then also just by chance the same can you hear it lightly yeah they're breaking rocks right now that are in the roads um so um at the same time this happened, I was like, wow. Oh, one other thing that I did in 2010, I started a festival here in Costa Rica called Envision Festival. I'm one of the co-founders. And last year, 2020, two weeks before the pandemic, we had 10,000 people dancing and learning and celebrating and breathing together, praying for a different world. And, uh, and so, all of these things, all of what we're doing is we want to redesign the world and we want to train people to be ready for that world. And, uh, and so at the same time, the TV show, we started Ecoversity, which is uh, we need to train this next generation of designers. It's like, I'm sure you can all, you can all relate. We all went to school for however long, but whatever you're doing now, you probably didn't learn in school. Like the way education is happening, like how can we train people to do the most important things. And so that's where Ecoversity, as a matter of fact, today, I might be last minute, if any of you are interested, I can send you a discount code. Maybe I'm gonna put my, my I'll put my Instagram here. That's probably the easy. If anybody's interested in joining, we're starting today a permaculture course, an online permaculture course, which is six months. And it starts today in two hours at 12 o'clock my time. That's in exactly two hours and 13 minutes. And all oh, right, Simona. And it's um, it's in the most incredible, it's a six month course. We meet twice a week for an hour and a half and don't take the course unless you're ready to have your entire scope and lenses of life radically shifted. Uh, I teach it with my friend, Penny Livingston, who has been at this for 40 years. Um, she's incredible. She's from Northern California. And, uh, and together we have just some of the most beautiful guests that come on our class and, and just the community that gets formed. You know, often so many of us feel like the outcasts and our friends, or we have the outcasts um, of our family because we're kind of freaky, we're a little different. All of a sudden you're in a, you know, a room with all these people that, that are dreaming of a different kind of world. And all of a sudden you feel like, ah, oh, so relieved that you're no longer alone. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to share maybe we can open up to a few questions is um is all of this i was driving in florida in my dad's prius one day and he had sirius radio and i was listening to this like ted radio and uh so as i was listening i realized that there was this guy talking about climate change and what does this even mean climate change like you know, what, what can we even do about climate change? Oh, if I bring my cloth bag to the supermarket, am I going to be helping the polar bears? Or it just, we feel so alone and so scared. And this is so radical. And who's the leader? Who's the uh, climate change leader? Is it Al Gore? Is it Greta? Like, what the hell are we going to do about it? So I started thinking about all the projects. You know, I, I have to say, I feel like a lot of the things I'm doing are really doing great things. Like people are really waking up and and we're creating incredible places for people to live. And, but, but it all felt so separated and, and kind of spread out. So I started thinking, what could I do right now that would feel like a replicable model that we can do in Romania and we could do it in 
Thailand and we could do it in Costa Rica and we could do it in Peru. What would a prototype new earth look like and how big is it? So I started thinking and it hit me right then in the car that day. I want to do it on a thousand hectares. A thousand hectares is 2,400 acres. And then I was sitting with Yuval, Cyprian. I was sitting with Yuval and Yuval was like, no, 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 don't do a thousand. Do 1,001. So you can do one, one and a sideways infinity sign. And, right. and so, so 1,001 is the new, is kind of like the macro umbrella project. And it, it comes down to redesigning the earth a thousand and one hectares at a time, merging conservation, reforestation, regenerative agriculture, community, and events, event space and education. So, so that's kind of what's happening. So right here where I'm sitting, we're sitting on 17 hectares. Up the street is Taco Tall, where human lives. Human li that pro project is 25 hectares. Alegria is 70 hectares. Right now, we're trying to close right now on the a property above. That's 108 hectares. This Saturday, I'm meeting with a guy, very wealthy guy from San Jose that owns 550 hectares. And all 1,001, it's a percentage breakdown. So what would we do with 1,001 hectares? Well, my vision is, remember, where do we start? We start with criteria. And my cre criteria for the land is it already needs to be radically deforested. Why? Because we want to come in and we want to regenerate it. And so the breakdown of the land is um, is ideally there's like between five and fifteen percent existing uh, existing forest, and, and we want to conserve that radically conserve it. And then between thirty five and forty percent, that's three hundred and fifty or four hundred hectares, we want to reforest. Now there's big nonprofits talking about reforesting and. But I haven't seen many places where they're reforesting 400 hectares. We want to do it right here, right now in Costa Rica. And, uh, and, and then we want to think about corridors and we want to design beyond our own borders. Like how can we design beyond our borders and how can we design beyond our own generation? Think about that. That's deep. Um, and then we want to do another 30 or 40%. We want to do regenerative agriculture. When I say regenerative agriculture, I'm focused on perennials. I'm focused on things like jackfruit, on breadfruit. Many people wear crosses around their neck. Some people wear breadfruit leaves. I'm looking at a breadfruit tree right, right there out of the corner of my eye. Breadfruit is this incredible fruit that's like this big, that's like a potato. You can make flour out of it. You can make French fries. You can make mashed potatoes, except instead of having to use big machines and use lots of chemicals, it grows on a tree. So it just keeps on giving. My neighbor, Patty, used to say, he used to say, boy, if you plan things right, all you do is reap. If you plan things right, all you do is reap. Reap means harvest. If you plan things right, all you do is receive. Yes. Beautiful. Bill Mollison, the founder of Permaculture, used to say, how can I design my reality to maximize hammock time? Awesome. Where do we start, Stephen? Where can we, you know, all around the world start? What's the start? Well, you can start by canceling your Amazon Prime subscription. <laughs> That's where you could start. Then you could start start doing a total reevaluation of Bartis. Your children are beautiful, by the way. Um, you could do a, a reevaluation of all the things you're buying. Like, like take a week and start writing down every day what you're buying and then zoom in on it and say, wait a minute, how can I do this and use less energy? How can I buy it from someone closer? How can I ideally buy it from someone I know? You know, like reevaluate, look through your garbage can, what's going out of your system? How can you create less garbage? You know, um, or you can all just move down here and get become a part of everything we're doing here because we got lots of room. Um, yeah, I mean, you can all get involved in, in 1001, what we're doing here. You can sign up for the permaculture course that starts in an hour and six minutes. It's the first class of a six-month course. And we just finished our first, uh, our first six-month course. And you guys, I never, ever thought I would ever teach permaculture online. I was totally against it. And now it's the, it, I'm blown away by what we did. Because normally the permaculture course is just two weeks. It's like, bang, 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 bang. 
now it's like six months and it's like really time to digest and really time to learn. Um, I want to go back. I want to make sure, I don't know how hard our stop is. My, I can go a few extra minutes. We only have five minutes, but I want to start with Robert's question um, about invasive species. All the species I'm working with them, I know intimately. A lot of the invasive species thing that happened, people were just bringing things from all over and spreading. I know intimately the plants that I'm working with and, uh, and I'm very intentional about the plants that I bring. So yeah, this is something that it's a great question and it's important. It's a, a lot of times people ask that. And uh, yeah, so I thought that would be my, oh my God, the most beautiful bird. I don't think you'll see it if I try to turn around. It's, uh, nope, it's gone. It's a bird I've never seen you guys. That's really, I've been living in this house for 10 years and I've never seen that bird that just landed. That's beautiful. Um, does, it, does anyone have any other questions or thoughts? Yeah, or? people have questions. I, I wanna be respectful of your time. I have another 10 written down, so, but I'll give the floor to Anybody else? Maybe you can type it in the chat if it's uh, easier. Or you can unmute. Uh, or you can unmute. Yeah. Great and to be here with people... you guys. I want to come to Romania. <laughs> yes, we'd love to show you around. Um, what's been your biggest struggle, uh, Stephen, in doing all of this phenomenal work? Um, I think in the past, like I think the whole financial reality, I mean, you have to understand is most of the places that are teaching and doing these important things are usually like underfunded hippie projects, like mm -hmm. real, like super hippie projects. And, and, and often hippies are good at doing certain things, but they're really bad at dealing with money and also asking for money. And, and it, so I think that was always a challenge. And I think for the first time now, like it's just kind of happening where people are just surrounding us. Um, and, and wanting to get involved because it makes sense. And it, you know, what's so crazy is that it doesn't even only make sense for the planet, but it also makes sense. Like these things are like, how can we create businesses that really hit that triple bottom line? Oh, you your, know what? Your dad I, has this. Yeah, your dad has this uh, 3T yeah. thing, right? Yeah, I mean, per, uh, profit, people, planet. How can we create businesses that merge all of those things? Um, You know what? I, I didn't... I don't even know if it's ready, but this is hot off the press. Last week, I went to this indigenous community that is living so horribly. Like they, they were ex-banana plantation workers. And because they didn't really have the right papers, they got totally screwed out of their like severance pay. They got fired and they're living in like houses that are falling down. Um, so one place that we could do something is we just started a GoFundMe. I'm going to ask if it's already up the thing. We're, we're trying right now to create a bigger video and project around this community of indigenous people that live right here that got totally screwed by Del Monte. Del Monte, I don't know if you have it in Romania. It's like, it's one of the biggest banana companies and they're disgusting. And what they've done to these people is so awful. So next week we're sending a whole video crew and we just started a GoFundMe. I'm asking for the GoFundMe. I actually just got it in my, it's like just hot off the press because we're trying to do it next week. Like, it's so radical. Like, it's amazing. There's all these nonprofits out there, but you know, it's like it where, where things really get, where things really happen is, um, uh, there it is. All right. Um, is, is grassroots, like people on the ground doing things. Let me look at some of these questions. What would you recommend someone living in a, I'm trying to find the link so I can throw it in there. Oh my God, here we go. I got it. I'm going to send it. Um, see, Brian, I'm going to send it to you because I have it in my phone. I'll send yeah. it to your WhatsApp. If you sure thing. I'll, send, I'll send it to everybody. That would be so awesome. We just start, like it hasn't even, it's not even finished the page yet. Like we just started it. But if you guys, if everyone could just give $5 or something, it would be amazing because we're really like, there's a French woman that is in Punta Mona right now that just took a course. And she's a, you know, she's like a pretty, she's doing there. We did this circus residency. We just had 90 people in Punta Mona for the last six weeks that are part of this circus residency. And she's like this circus girl that's there. And she is like this professional filmmaker from France. And she's like, so inspired that she's like, I want to stay here and help you guys. So we just started this GoFundMe so that we could get her and get a crew down so we could document how messed up this world is. It's like, I sit here in my house and I eat these fruits. Oh, I didn't even show you all these fruits that I have. We got to do that too. Um, 
yeah, anyway, so I, I sent you the, the link there. Um, what would you recommend to somebody living, someone in, living a, in a big city? Um, like I said, just start honing in on all the things you're buying. Think about who you're supporting when you buy something. Maybe it's going to cost a little bit more if you, um, if you buy it from somebody that's making it locally. But everything, everything you're buying, you could be, you could be gentler and kinder. Like, how can you, and support people that you know? Like, it's so, it's so amazing. Like, one example, like, like um, everybody gives Christmas gifts, and I was like, listen, my friend Human, who lives up the street, he's the most unbelievable musician. His songs are so powerful and incredible. I recommend, I, re I recommend, right, Luisa? I recommend rather than buying something on Amazon for your friends for Christmas. Buy your buy your friend CD for them. Like support your friends. It's a win win. Um, so that's what I would recommend. You know, and then, you know, if you want to get more macro, like maybe join like this. The oh, the other thing I would do: knock on your neighbor's door, especially if you don't know them, and introduce yourself, and see if there's any way you could support them. Awesome. So radical, like oh my god, you know, it's like knock on your neighbor's door. Hello, my <laughs> name is Steven. I'm your neighbor. And I care about you. And if there's anything I can do, that's radical. That's like transformational. Um, I mean, these are little things. You could join your local government. Like, you know, go get a meeting with the mayor. Like if you see things that aren't, it's not that hard to meet the mayor. Write down things that you don't like. Come up with and, and, and come together with a group of neighbors and figure out possible solutions. And then go meet with the mayor, you know, and start getting involved in local politics. One last question. Um... If you'd be kind to take. Yeah, of course. How can we how can we transform the cities we live in? And so it's kind of similar question. It's a similar uh, question, but I honestly, like from my heart, I support I support everyone that's doing amazing things in oh, it's so funny. Uh, my I just got to notice that I have a call with the film girl from France right after this to talk about. I can't wait to tell her. Cyprian, make sure you share the GoFundMe link. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, maybe in the chat. It'd be awesome. Or wherever, maybe in your company thing. Oh, Anybody yeah. that's here, it would be awesome. You guys, this is like hot off the press. Like it's literally like we decided last night, one of our interns made the GoFundMe and we're like next week. Like I just went there last week and it, it, it brought everything full circle. Like this whole thing started for me in the banana plantation. And then last week I found myself in the banana plantation and here I am like, um, oh, it's in Spanish, the GoFundMe? got to change that um yeah yeah so um so we we just decided like we're gonna do something about it when you don't like something don't just endure it you know the word endure how you say that in romanian endure, uh, endure, endure. <laughs> yeah don't just cry it like change it analyze it come together in a group and fix it like that's the problem with humanity is we've just become so numb. We've become so numb to this old ways of doing things like, and the old way things are, and we've just accepted it. Don't accept it anymore. Things are the way they are, but they don't need to be this way anymore. You, 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 Bartis' son, you could do this right now, starting right now, make radical changes starting with yourself, rippling out to your family, to your community, and eventually to the world. Steven, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for taking time. I, uh, maybe I'm gonna unmute everybody for, uh, uh, you know, a big hey, let's cheer. Everybody go like this. Everybody put on your cameras. If you don't have it on, turn on your camera. This is something we've been doing in all the Alegria webinars. Everybody turn on your camera. Come on, you can do it. Even if you're in your nightgown, like my abuela. Okay. <laughs> do it, do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, everybody. We're not getting off until everybody. Come on, everybody. Turn on your cameras. Even if you, even if your hair is messy. Here, I'll put my hair all messy so nobody feels bad. Thank you for <laughs> inspiring. Uh, everybody, go like this. <laughs> Alright, and then let's send all the love and energy to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> So much energy. I want to eat what you're eating soon. Thanks so oh, much. Cacao. Check out the cacao. We can close with that. Let's have a look. This came from right there in my yard.
I have three different kinds of cacao. Hey, Bart, this is kids. You know where chocolate comes from? <laughs> awesome. Uh, mm. Thank you so much, Stephen. I'm going to hang yeah. up here. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you soon. Everybody go to Punta Mona and uh, to all the Bye. Bye. Thank you.